Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Bill Brock, and uh, I am right now trying to add my buddy on here, and we're gonna do a uh, we're gonna do a Facebook Live deal with uh, there he is, invite with Nomar. And uh, Nomar is awesome. So Nomar is the author of this book. Hopefully it's not backwards, but it probably is. Uh, UFOs over Maine. So as soon as Nomar hops on here, we're going to talk about this book. And we're going to talk about a, a bunch of really cool stuff as far as like uh, really just paranormal and UFO stuff here in Maine. So I am stoked about Nomar hopping on. We just sent him an invite. So uh so hopefully he'll be hopping on here in just a minute. But also I wanted to talk a minute about uh, Rogue Mysteries. So we've just started uh, basically getting back onto Rogue Mysteries because, I don't know, make a long story short, we had some really weird stuff happen. Um, pretty much we, we went out to investigate the Betty and Barney Hill abduction area. We went to the actual site where they were abducted. Um, man, and it got weird. You're going to have to watch the... Uh, Oh, there he is. Um, bam. Alright, so I just tried to... Weird stuff going on, and uh, you got to check it out. We're about to go out and uh, film the next episode, and we're going to be doing that with some experts that uh, I'm really excited about. Yay! There's Nomar. What's up, brother? What up? How's it going, man? Good. Billy B the place to be what are you guys up to oh uh, man i'm just hanging out and uh reading this really awesome book from somebody nice nice yeah. i uh unfortunately am not reading that but i'm reading uh nick redfern's uh nessie so oh, man. i love nick dude he's such a cool guy i haven't read that yet what do you think about it so far it's really interesting man there's um uh, lots of interesting theories. You know, Nick, he always comes from left field with stuff and in an already left field uh, 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 genre, if you will. Um, but he talks about UFO encounters over Loch Ness and, and uh, hauntings and lots of different stuff that you don't really associate with Loch Ness. So it's pretty eye opening. It's pretty cool. Nice, man. That's really awesome. Um, of course, man, I got to get back to your book. We're both Mainers. You live right here in Maine, right? That's right. Yeah. It, uh, it says in your book you're from way up north, Bob. That's right. I'm up in uh, Bangor, originally from uh, the Bar Harbor area. Actually, originally, originally from Fort Kent. Uh, that's where I was born and stayed there till about uh, uh, five years old, maybe. And then we moved to the island, and uh, uh, and that's where it feels like I grew up. You know, like that's where I went to high school and all that stuff. But I'm originally from Fort Kent, and uh, that's where I think uh, I had my first. UFO encounter. Well, you know, that's not very far from the Allagash, right? So, like, the that's Allagash right. is probably one of the most famous abduction stories here in Maine. So, uh, about far, how far from, like, the Allagash were you up in Fort Kent? I actually lived right on the Allagash River. However, the encounter happened at the Allagash Wilderness Waterway, which was probably about an hour and a half south from where I was. Wow. So, do you mind talking about your encounter and what happened? Yeah, uh, I was right around um, four years old, and uh, I had gone to bed for the night. I uh, was woken up in the middle of the night by some thunder, or what I thought was thunder. And uh, so I opened my eyes, and I could hear like rain spatter uh, on my windows. So I kind of sat up, and I was like, ooh, a thunder and lightning storm. And uh, I sat up, and I could start seeing some, uh, some lightning go across the, the clouds and things like that. And then all of a sudden, um, there was a really, a really uh, big lightning strike. And if I were to ask you to draw a lightning bolt, um, you would probably draw that, you know, yellow jagged line. And, right. you know, my four, four-year-old mind, it looked like a, a lightning bolt got stuck in the cloud. And electricity was coming off it, and there were booms, and I watched it for a little while, and then faded off to sleep. I honestly don't know really what happened. I just woke up in the morning. So when I got up in the morning, I went to the bathroom, and I was coming back to my bedroom. I could still see 
the lightning bolt stuck in the cloud. And I thought that was weird. Yeah. So I went and got my dad and brought him all the way upstairs. I, I don't know why we just didn't go out the front door, but, you know, I brought him all the way upstairs to look out the window and it was gone. And, uh, and he also informed me that there had been no storm the night before. And uh, so I'm thinking that might have been my first UFO encounter. You know, I don't know really what else to make of it. You know, lightning bolts don't get stuck in clouds. You know what I mean? Right, right. So um, is that really what sparked your interest and made you really, like, try to understand what you, you had seen? Yeah, yeah. Um, that coupled with I saw the Northern Lights a few months later. And those two incidents kind of, like, taught me at a young age that, that the world was just like huge and strange because all I knew was, you know, you're four years old. All you know is like your house and the, you know, your backyard. And, uh, and, you know, I wasn't even in kindergarten yet or anything. So uh, I was like, wow, this, the world is strange and a little scary. And then, which I don't really get into in my book um, nor the new book that I have coming out, but I was plagued with a lot of paranormal things in the house in Fort Kent. And uh, it made Adam, me really And I wanna make sure that I understand this because we have a lot of weird stuff going on right now with an investigation that I'm doing, uh, with the Betty and Barney Hill abduction. So um, you talk about paranormal experiences. It, were these experiences after you saw that UFO? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and it was more of the traditional sense, if you will. You know, it, it felt like a haunting. I felt as though I was visited by something. Uh, I've actually never publicly spoke about this, but uh, it feels, uh, I felt that I was haunted a lot as a child. I was, I was given a hard time, if you will, without really, you know, getting too much into it. And um, uh, it, it lasted for quite a while and it really scared me. And that mixed with the UFO sighting, mixed with growing older and eventually getting out of that house, it grew into a fascination with all things paranormal. And when I became a teenager, I was no longer scared of it. And in fact, I was like, if I was scared, other people are probably scared and maybe I can help them with it or maybe I can tell their story, you know? And, and that's kind of, uh, as a teenager, that's kind of where the, uh, the lifelong passion of like researching it came from, you know? Yeah, yeah. You don't research much as a as a child. You you know you might watch a show like I was into sightings and and uh, unsolved mysteries and you know things like that and and obviously scary movies which I can thank my mother for. She got me into horror movies. <laughs> uh, but uh, but so, yeah, that's that's kind of in a nutshell. Uh, where all right, started. Yeah, people that just joined in, man. He wrote this amazing book called UFOs of Remain. He's got a ton of like really useful experience and, and i really want to know if you've ever encountered anyone while interviewing people for the book or, or just in, in your your daily you know kind of paranormal research have you ever encountered anyone that had something else kind of like you did you know what i mean so like you had this ufo experience and then you had this paranormal experience that may be coupled together with what you had seen have you ran into anyone else? uh i have yeah um the uh, David Stevens case, which happened in uh, Norway, Maine. Uh, there's some speculation about that story. And uh, there was so much more to the story that I actually wrote a revised version in my new book. And I've also uh, befriended uh, Brent Rains. He is the uh, one of the original investigators of the David Stevens case, which also intertwines with the Herbert Hopkins case, which is a famous men in black case that happened in, in Maine. And Herbert Hopkins uh, was a, a psychiatrist, hypnotherapist, and he was helping uh, David Stevens through uh, hypnotic regressions to talk and figure things out about his experience. Well, during that time, uh, David Stevens uh, was experiencing paranormal activity, reportedly paranormal activity in his home. Uh, he would, very odd things. He heard his, he claims to have heard from an unplugged, shut off TV, the word UFO, which is really weird. He also claimed to see black boxes, like coming out of the walls in his, you know, just tiny black boxes, you know, coming out of the walls of his home. Um, he went back to the site. Sorry, getting a phone call. <laughs> um, uh, 
he went back to the site of his sighting and he said it be began to rain ash while he was there, which is very odd. Uh, he would get knocks on the door and it would come in threes, doom, 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 which being a paranormal investigator, that's, it has been reported to be like the sign of a demon when there's three loud knocks, you know? And, uh, and of course, that's probably for another uh, broadcast or another thing, but, you know, demonology getting into alien activity, is it all connected? Is it all the same thing? And they're just called different things by different people. I, you know, I can get into a whole other thing. But yeah, the David Stevens case, it's an amazing case. If you go to my website, ufosovermain.com, you can actually read uh, the three-part report by Brent Rains, Shirley Fickett, and Dr. Schwartz uh, about their entire investigation of the David Stevens case. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing. That, that's really cool because um, <clears throat> I don't want to get too much into what's going on uh, on video because I want people to be able to go and actually like check it out. But uh, on this Betty and Barney Hill case that we're working on, um, we did bring a psych again. Um, I don't want to tell too much, but uh, she had a connection with Betty Hill. Uh, she believed that she was actually talking to Betty Hill while we were at that location. Um, after that, you can actually find this on the internet. Uh, she was ran off of uh, the USS Salem. Um, after she was ran off of the Salem, she went back home and had a really crazy experience. And she doesn't really want to share that too much. I think she feels a lot like you did. Uh, and you don't share it for you know, living, but when it happens to us, the trouble is like we should be able to be like our that was and, and everything okay. but man that's not how it went down but uh we are definitely going to be going back to the site with uh, a frank box you ever heard of a frank box yeah nice yeah yeah so do you know anything about the history of, of the frank box uh from what i remember i believe the creator lost his daughter uh, I can't remember if it was a car accident or something, but, you know, it devastated him, of course. And uh, I don't remember all the particulars, but he created um, this electronic device, uh, which I believe essentially uh, runs through uh, radio stations or, or uh, quick emissions of, of, of uh, radio signals to try and communicate um, with uh, uh, spirits or, or, or whatever or whatever it might be. Uh, that's really close. Uh, there's a guy named Ty Gowan. He, he works with Haunt Me. Friggin' awesome guy. Uh, everything that Haunt Me does is great. Uh, so if yeah, anybody it's a good show. Like, it is, man. They do a really good job. So anyway, Ty really uh, got into what the Frank Box is, where it came okay. from, just everything about it. And uh, man, he, he's really good at explaining that. Uh, he let me know that basically this Frank Box was designed to speak with aliens, man. The designer really built this thing to speak with aliens. And he knows the whole story, and he gives that story like, man, he, he's good. He, he, he delivers it well. So basically, um, I know that the Frank Box was designed to speak with aliens, and that's a big reason why I'm going to be taking it to the location. Whoa. So, man, I'm excited to be able to do that. And, uh, you know, like, I probably shouldn't say this stuff even like uh, even now, because like uh, a lot of people want, might want that surprise. But, I mean, this is a this is exciting for me. This is a real investigation and it's taking some strange turns, but uh, I'm excited to be able to put it out there. Um, as far as your book goes, man, like I want to talk about one of my favorite abductions here in Maine for people who don't really know a whole lot about it. There was uh, the Allagash abductions. Um, a few minutes ago, we kind of hit on a little bit, but if you don't mind, I'd like to know, uh, you know, kind of tell us the Cliff Notes version of the story, and then we'll talk about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, it's, it's definitely kind of a long, complex story. Um, but so the Cliff Notes version is these four guys uh, going to college together out of the state, and they wanted to come up to Maine to uh, go camping. And uh, while they were in Maine, uh, one night, uh, while they were, I think they were just camping and there was with some other people, some other campers were like in the area. They all kind of saw a light in the sky. A couple nights later, you know, they didn't think too much of it, but a couple nights later, they're out doing some night fishing. And uh, while they were night fishing, they ended up seeing a bright light in the sky again, uh, all four of them. And then they saw that this light descended and then was potentially chasing them. And then all of a sudden, what they knew was they were. Uh, taken up in this beam. They were they were called being taken up in the beam and put onto the ship. And uh, they're all kind of lying there or sitting there looking at each other. And they're like, what the hell's going on? Um, 
a, a very surreal moment for them. And then uh, what proceeds to happen is really like your classic alien abduction story. And, um, uh, but they didn't know any of this information for quite a long time. Right. Uh, the way it happened to them is that they saw a light in the sky and then they um, uh, rode their canoe back to shore. When they got back to shore, they saw that the bonfire that they had built was now down to embers, which uh, showed them that they had been gone longer than what they thought. They thought they were on the water for a certain amount of time. With the bonfire being in embers, it shows that they were gone for much longer than they thought. So they had a case of missing time. It wasn't until uh, a few years later when one of the uh, abductees uh, was having some pretty terrible dreams uh, that involved kind of aliens surrounding his bed and poking and probing him and, and uh, you know, weird things like that. So eventually... He goes to a, a MUFON conference, runs into uh, or starts talking to some people about his experience. And they're like, hey, you got to talk to Ray Fowler. Ray Fowler is a uh, very prominent name in ufology. You know, he's right up there with, uh, you know, John Keel and, and uh, you know, uh, the likes of those people. And uh, has since retired and is actually in your neck of the woods teaching uh, adult ed cat classes in the, the paranormal, which is pretty cool. Uh, oh, down wow. in uh, Kennebunk. Yeah, he's down in Kennebunk. So you can actually take a class with Ray Fowler. It's pretty cool. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, Ray Fowler uh, uh, starts speaking to this guy, and, and he's like, I think you need some, some you know, hypnotherapy. And uh, that's when uh, those guys start going under, and their full story comes out. And then Ray Fowler uh, recounted the entire uh, experience uh, in a book called the uh, uh, the Allagash abductions amazing book it was also covered on a uh, unsolved mysteries that's where I first heard it back when I was a kid um, they actually appeared on the Joan Rivers show <laughs> when that was really? going on yeah and uh, but uh, recently there has been some infighting um, I don't know how much you know about the Rendlesham Forest case, you know, with the, the two gentlemen. And then, uh, well, it's kind of like uh, Britain's Roswell. It was uh, a UFO that was seen uh, uh, in, in Britain uh, on a U.S. Air Force base in, in Britain. And those guys are alive and well and, and doing some infighting. There's not a lot of agreement on what's going on. So a similar thing is kind of happening with the Allagash guys. And it's really one guy who's not... Uh, uh, who says this stuff really didn't happen after saying for years that it had. And uh, uh, the three other guys are sticking to their story. And, uh, uh, but the other guys making claims that, uh, you know, they just did it for fame and money and, and all this good stuff. And, uh, but this particular gentleman has been, uh, uh, has been known to have some aggressive behavior, some, some irrational behavior, and he's actually been banned from some conferences for his behavior, and, and uh, which those, the, the three remaining who claim that the abduction happened uh, are implying that this is why he can't be trusted, you know, so don't believe his word, you know, like believe us, and, uh, and it's such a great case, and, uh, and I hate to see that they're fighting, I just want them to all go out to dinner and be like, wow, that was crazy, <laughs> you know, uh, but it is what it is, and, and, uh, and I tend to believe it, but I, I don't know if I want to, if I'm biased, because it was one of the first cases I heard about, um, but honestly, the, the counterpoints that the, uh, the, the one guy has uh, aren't really valid, he was saying that the, uh, the bonfire, they didn't have missing time because the bonfire uh, was made with small, smaller logs. And the other three guys are like, no, they were made with like pretty much tree stumps, you know, like they're really thick logs and they shouldn't have right. burned so quickly. And uh, so he's got a lot of, uh, he's got a lot of these counterpoints that don't hold a lot of weight. So I still tend to believe, you know, the, the three remaining guys, you know. Right, right. And honestly, um, they, haven't made, they haven't made a lot of money. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, they're not getting rich off this thing. Uh, yeah. You know, Barney Hill uh, actually had issues after, um, after the sighting. He really didn't want to talk about it all that much. And then, you know, his wife, obviously, man, she was, thought, she was everywhere. Uh, Betty wanted to talk about it, and for her, that's how she uh, dealt with it. I think that when people have these experiences, I think that there's a little bit of PTSD that, that happens. You know? Absolutely. I mean, this is, this is a, a real traumatic experience for these folks. Um, I, you know, maybe he just doesn't want to deal with it anymore. Do you know what I mean? So, like, 
I know that you know lost on Monsters Underground and on TV, like that's a whole side of, of things that I really I don't know, who cares? Man? But on TV, it's a big freaking deal. I like this stuff. I want to research stuff. So when people talk about that, I'm not too worried about it. I'd rather talk about what I'm doing right now. I'd rather talk about, you know, chasing Betty and Barney Hill stuff and, and, and what I'm doing now. So yeah. he kind of feels the same way. Maybe he's just tired man you know like he's been talking about this stuff for so long and he's probably taken a lot of ridicule he's probably had his friends telling him he's crazy for even saying anything so uh i believe it happened i personally think they had an experience that day uh i've done a lot of research on it i haven't been able to actually talk to the people who were abducted uh that's that's next on my list i'm hoping to put that into the uh the rogue mysteries episode list uh before too long because i really want to go up there man you're welcome to go with me too i'm going to go right to the place where they're abducted and uh and use myself as bait i'm just going to go to the middle of the pond and sit there man but uh i love it yeah yeah definitely um so is there any other um encounters here in maine that you'd like to talk to you before we get off or talk about before we get off here uh, there's just a ton of them in this book that are really, yeah. really good. There, there's a bunch in that book. Um, I've probably, in my research over the two book span, there I've probably come across 600 cases, and there's uh, probably uh, uh, 10 times more than that uh, in Maine alone, and that includes crop circles, men in black, abductions. Um, there's one story about a kid uh, who was abducted when he was younger, and it was his first sexual experience was with an entity yeah it's it's in my new book and um uh, that's crazy you know what i mean and and you know do i believe all these stories you know not necessarily but when someone's so sincere and you know how mainers are man like we're reserved we're hard working and we don't want to be ridiculed you know and 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 uh, this guy actually worked with john mack which was really cool and um so Lots of crazy stories, but one that I feel is really big that a lot of people don't talk about is the Loring Air Force Base encounters. Now, the the famous uh, Loring Air Force Base encounters, or the more famous one, happened in 1975 over a three-day span. And we're talking almost everybody on the base seeing this UFO hovering just above the runway. It was picked up on radar. The wing commander, which is the highest ranking officer on base, saw it with his own eyes which is extremely interesting. And uh, to this day, if you look at Project Blue Book reports, there's, um, there's no uh, resolution to the case. They did try to resolve it as drug, smug drug smuggling helicopters, uh, but it didn't hold any weight. And uh, so it has since gone into a unresolved category. However, 11 years before that, the base encountered um, two other incidents that is rarely talked about. And one of them is another UFO being seen hovering over the base. But the more interesting encounter happened in December of 64. And there was an air policeman who was on patrol. And um, it, uh, it contained nuclear weapons at the time. And they had bombers armed with nuclear weapons. And he was patrolling the bomber area. And he saw um, these shadows by the snowbank uh, lurking around. So he figured, you know, that it was people. And he ordered them to come out and ordered them to come out. And they wouldn't. So he fired a warning shot. And still nothing happened. And so uh, all of a sudden, they kind of appeared in front of him. They were about 10, yeah, they're about 10, 15 feet in front of him. And as an instinct, he could see that they were non-human. And instinctually, he took aim and fired at him. He's pretty sure he hit him, but they vanished. Just as that happened, now you got two shots fired on base near nuclear weapons. Well, and this was about two in the morning. Well, the base comes alive at this point. Lights come on. Other air policemen show up on site. And they're apprehending the guy who took the shots. And he's trying to explain himself like, no, 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 there was intruders and they weren't human. And they're like, uh, you're crazy and you can't fire your weapon near nuclear weapons and you're relieved of duty. So they relieved him of duty that night. And he was kicked out of the military. And uh, a few months later, you know, he was telling this story to people who would listen. And a few months later, he was drinking at a bar that's close to the base. 
and uh, some of his buddies from the base were there. So they, they went over and talked to him and they said, Hey man, you know, like that stuff really happened. He's like, yeah, absolutely. And they said, well, they make fun of you on base. They, they, they call you the, the guy that shot at little green men. And he's like, well, they can, they can say what they want, but I'll tell you one thing. They're not green. That's how wow. we ended the story. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's, uh, you know, and that's a very, you know, little known encounter that happened up at Loring, but, you know, extremely interesting. And um, so there's a lot of strange stuff that happens in this state, man. Uh, you know, it, it, I, I was in the army and I can tell you this, you do not fire a weapon unless you know what you're firing at and you are prepared to answer any issues that uh, may arise out of you firing that weapon. It, they don't like that, man. They don't want you to fire anything. Yeah. At any. So uh, for this guy to, to fire a weapon and not be given like an article 15 or not be like reprimanded in some way or something that kind of makes me wonder because uh I know that right now, if you crack off a couple rounds for no reason, you're liable to get what's called an Article 15. Basically, you know, they take money and rank. So uh, I would like to know if they actually did anything to this guy. Uh, the, uh, the, most, the, the most that I could find out was that the sergeant wanted to, uh, or whoever was in charge at the time, wanted to, or thought about charging him with treason at, at the time. Um, that That's a comment he made. But other than that, he was just promptly relieved of duty. Wow. That's yeah, really but that's all I could find out. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a trip. Yeah, I had no idea about any of that. Um, Loring, Air, 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 if I could talk, Loring Air Force Base is absolutely about as far north in Maine as you can get. It is right up there where you're from in Fort Kent. And, yeah. man, yeah, I've been there. There is just nothing around yeah. Loring Air I, uh, I did an overnight investigation there. Uh, I, uh, I talked to the cops to let them know, like, I'm going to be over there because they have a job corpse and, you know, there, there is some activity on the outskirts of the base, you know, but I let them know I was going to be on the, the, the thick interior and, uh, and I would be there overnight. And, uh, uh, and that was back in April and it was a pretty crazy experience, man. Meaning I was alone and there's absolutely no light. Uh, other than what you bring with you. Uh, so I was checking out hangars and I did about a, you know, a little over a hundred miles an hour on the runway just cause you can, <laughs> you know, cause there's nobody up there to do anything. Uh, yeah. But then, but when night came, it, it, it took on a different atmosphere and I ended up catching a light in the sky and uh, I have it on my YouTube channel that you can, uh, that you can check out. Um, and you're in Loring, it, 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 a light in the sky in Loring. Yeah, yeah, it wow. was uh, it was near the uh, the the radar tower, and it uh, I'm estimating it might have been 300 feet up in the air, but it was tough to gauge. You know, it was middle of the night, and uh, but uh, in the the video that I caught, I also added some stills, some close ups, and uh, where it was in relation to the radio tower. So you guys should check it out. It's pretty cool. There's no more Slavic on YouTube. Nice. Yeah, I, I encourage everyone to go check you out, man. That's why I wanted to bring you on today because you're mm -hmm. awesome, dude. I've been reading this book and I'm really enjoying it, you know, so uh, it was important to me get to at least get you on for a few minutes and talk about it because uh, there's not a lot of people that recognize how active Maine is as far as the UFO scene is concerned. Uh, we are definitely right up there with like people out west, man. There's a lot of people that, that see something around here, right? Yeah, man, absolutely. Hey, check it out. Alex is watching. What up, Alex? Can't wait. Can't wait for the champ. <laughs> oh, yeah. On the trail of champ. <laughs> What's up, Alex? Yeah, good to see you're here. Yeah, he's an awesome kid, dude. We went out and um, basically did a road trip last year. Went to uh, uh, the Mothman Festival. Went to like the Ringing Rocks in in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania. And I don't know. We just went all over the place. It was absolutely a blast. Went to some really cool Native American mounds in Ohio. Uh, yeah, man, we just had a blast last year, and that was, and Alex just said, hey, uh, that was, like, the <laughs> first time we got to, like, uh, you know, meet the kid, but uh, he's definitely a good guy. Let's see if he'll come on and talk yes. to us, right, because I was going to get off here, but since Alex is here, we'll see if he'll get on. Uh, I don't really know what I'm doing. Maybe I can figure it out, but yeah, man, I'm super stoked about uh, talking with you today, and I'd like to, like, eventually uh get out in the field with you and, and go do something, yeah, you know, and, uh, track something. You know? Yeah. Let's, let's go up to Allagash or 
Loring or, you know, something. We'll, we'll figure something out, you know. There's a bunch of stuff in Southern Maine I got stories about, too. And, and actually, uh, I'm parked right now. Uh, I'm not sure how to change my camera around, so bear with me. I'm parked right now on Mount Hope Avenue in an area in Bangor, Maine, where there was a uh, UFO encounter with a guy named John King. And this is just about the area where it happened. And this is uh, an incident where he actually shot at the UFO with a gun. And that happened back in uh, 1966. Uh, and, I'm, and, and I'm on site here. So again, I'll try to show you guys. Oh, that's so cool. Oh, wow. I guess it doesn't look like too much, but you know, this is uh, approximately the area where it happened. So um, I thought that would be fun. <laughs> Right. Yeah, man. That's really awesome. Uh, I'd like to know more about that story, too. Is it in your book? Yeah, it's in, there's a very short version in that book, and then I have an expanded version in my new book. Uh, I think okay. that in that book that you have, it's called Shots Fired. Okay. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Uh, I just haven't read that part yet. I mean, I went through and, like, picked all the good stories that, like, I was all interested <laughs> in. I need to go back and, like, just read the whole thing now. But um, cool. all right, well, I'm going to get off here. We've been on here for like uh, about a half an hour now, but I really do oh, appreciate wow. you, uh, coming on and chatting with me, man. And uh, anybody out there that's interested in this book, how can they find it? Uh, anywhere books are sold, you can just go to uh, Amazon as well. But what I like is IndieBound.org. And IndieBound.org will let you do a search function for all the mom and pop bookstores in the entire nation. So if you're living in California, if you're living in Boston, if you're living in Maine, uh, you just do a search with your zip code. And then once you do a search with your zip code, do a search for the book you want, and it tells you what bookstores are carrying it. It's a pretty cool way to keep the mom and pops in business, you know? Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, awesome. All right, man. Well, thanks again for hanging out with me. And uh, let's not be strangers, man. Let's get out there and uh, find us a UFO. <laughs> I like it. And I can't wait right. for the new uh, Rogue Mysteries. Take care, uh, buddy. Have a good one, brother. Talk to you soon. See you.